So, uh, <coughs> good morning. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, delighted to be invited to, to present. Um, my name is Mark Basham. I work for a company called Technetics, uh, based in the UK. Technetics works uh, globally, and I'm responsible for our fibre portfolio. If you know Technetics, you'll know that it's been quite strong in the cable space over the last 30 odd years. Um, in more recent times, we started to push into you know, the pure fibre play. Um, and then in the last sort of four or five years, we started to add some more uh, fiber active components, basically OLTs um, and other parts to help service providers build their new FTTH, FTTP, FTTX, FTTA, whatever you like, networks. So today I'd like to provoke the thought process around how you go about building fiber networks. Um, and particularly perhaps an alternative approach to the sort of big bang approach of putting large chassis based solutions in and looking at a more granular, smaller approach using smaller LTs, being much more targeted, uh, which opens up some potential opportunities around the economics, but also how you target specific customer groups and ultimately how you build that network. So a little bit more about Technetics, if, if you're not aware, I think most people are, so I won't labour this slide, most of the information is there. So the company is over 30 years old, it, it is a UK headquartered company, the founder of the company is still the CEO of the company, uh, we operate in 70 countries, we've got representation in 19 of those countries, we've got profitable, which is important, and we've got a, a significant portfolio of, of major customers, big and, and small. Obviously, it's very strong in an HFC components, so the equipment's used in cable networks, high republic <coughs> networks, amplifiers, taps, fiber nodes, etc. But, uh, my apologies gone too fast, but more recently into the fiber space, as I just mentioned. Um, so, we'll talk a little bit about some of the technologies. This is really not to promote, this is more to promote my around how we might build networks. So, um, as you'll probably see for the, uh, the abstract for this particular session, I'm going to touch on all of these points throughout this presentation. So it's, it's not going to be sort of dogmatic in the way that's laid out there, um, but I'm trying to cover off some of the points here around how we go about building those networks and can we change some of the economics, probably not changing the real cost of it, but changing the spend profile. So when do I spend that money and when do I get that return on that money and can I then reuse that cash that I start to... To, uh, to bring into the company to expand my network. Can I change the technical real estate in terms of what that looks like? So rather than large street cabinets or central offices or hub sites, is there a different approach to again de deploying FTTX? Can I improve service coverage? I know there's a number of operators here that are focused on rural networks, but it's not just the rural uh, aspects either, it's that sort of suburb and it's those fringe locations that are, for whatever reason, not getting supported or it's more difficult to support. By doing that, can I, in that sort of more distributed architecture, can I change the, the way the power looks? So rather than have large systems with large power feeds, can I have lots of smaller systems with smaller power feeds? And that has some benefits as well. Smaller systems, when they fail, have less customers attached to them. So the blast radius of the smaller system is is less than a large system. So we'll touch on some of these things. That investment model that I spoke about is more success based. So can I spend money today and get a return on it very quickly rather than a long term return? We all know, I think a lot of the fault nets are under pressure because they're not getting the penetration and the returns on the investment that their, their investors are expecting. Um, Higher split ratios, and we'll touch on that in a few minutes. And then how do we start to mix some of these things together? I'm sure you're aware, you know, a lot of the alternates are building XGS pond, this G pond, we can touch on what all that means in a second. But there's also talk about 25 gig pond, and ultimately 50 gig pond, and how, how do we build and augment those sorts of networks? So this won't be a surprise, and I'm sure you're all very, very aware, a lot of you will be involved in this. There is a huge amount of money being spent in building fibre to the property, to the home. Depending on who you talk to, that's running into billions of pounds, dollars, euros globally. Significant focus on the UK, of course, right at the moment, but that is a worldwide, we're seeing the same in North America, across Europe, uh, Far East, Australasia, and so on. And 
the regulator, governments, councils are all stimulating that. They want fibre to the home. They can see that's got huge benefits. We all saw that during the, uh, the COVID period where people were working from home, they needed faster connectivity. That sort of changed perhaps some of the dynamics of how we work. And we've all you know, got multiple access devices from phones to set-top boxes to, to streaming to doing work. Um, there's, there's a multitude of applications. There's a lot of investment being pushed into building fibre networks in all shapes and forms. A lot of it being stimulated, as you said, by, by government and regulatory bodies and so on. Things like funding schemes, the UK is doing it. We're seeing it in the US with their BEAD program as well, trying to get fibre into those areas outside of the major urban big sort of conurbation cities. GPON is predominantly what's being deployed in most of these locations for initial fibre bills. For those who are not aware, so GPON operates at one, and a, one gig to two and a half gig that's a shared amount of bandwidth around the customers that you've connected to that PON network. For the Yorknets in the UK, we're seeing that increase to 10 gigabits. So that's XGS PON, as I mentioned earlier. There's plans for many of the bigger vendors are already pushing 25 gig pon, 50 gig pon, even 100 gig pon is being spoken about. You can't get away from the, the point though that the biggest cost ultimately of that, that program is, is actually digging, burying fibre or hanging fibre up. That's your, your large cost part to the network outside of the actors. In fact, if you sort of took a rough split of it, the build of fibre, digging, Pulling fibre is probably about 70% of the cost of getting to a home. The next highest part of that cost is the active device that you put inside the home, of course, because it's electronics, it costs money, it's going to be maintained, looked after. And then behind that will be the, the OLT part, the bit that's sort of providing the connectivity to the, to the endpoints. There are alternatives, of course. Some of the alternates in the UK have started with point to point or active Ethernet, so that's a dedicated fibre to every home from the point of presence. Pond though is looking to be a more economic model and we're seeing a lot of people move, and move from that point-to-point uh, -point type of connectivity <coughs> to, to, a, to, a pond, um, to a pond configuration. And of course there's DOCSIS, there is cable networks, there's extensive cable networks in the UK, but there are extensive cable networks across Europe, North America. Some of those are not going to go away, they're being invested in significantly. Uh, the standards are changing, the technology has moved up, more uh, improved modulation schemes that allow greater throughput, so we're seeing the cable networks also able to match, and in fact, there are claims they can be better than an XGS pond network in terms of their overall throughput. So a lot of investment going in that area as well. And I mentioned it earlier, so in the UK we're seeing this quite a lot. A lot of the investors had perhaps higher expectations in terms of the, the cash flow and the returns that they were expecting from some of those fibre builds. Perhaps penetrations haven't been as high as the original business plan. Maybe it was more optimistic than, than uh, it's actually turned out to be. Um, so there's a lot of scrutiny now. Some of those companies may be sold, will get acquired, may go out of business, because they're not generating the cash flow to drive their business, both in terms of operating as it is today, but also growing. So homes past is not what the, uh, the, the investors are now interested in. <coughs> They're interested in, have you got customers connected to it? Are you generating a healthy revenue? Have you, are you cash flow positive? Can we build a business around that and build that asset? So they're interested in what services can you offer? How do you differentiate from the competition? What's the average revenue per user? These are all standard metrics. What the net present value? the value of that, that network is and, and going forward and ask me, am, am I getting a return on it? Are you going to pay me back that lovely investment I put into your net, into your, your business? So what we're starting to see is a greater degree of focus, much more targeted approach. We're seeing this with some of the rural network operators, that they're small, they're nimble, they're agile, they're very focused, they understand their customers. How do you take that model and apply that at scale? So just in terms of some of the terminology, some of you may not be aware of some of these key components. It's a very simplified diagram of a passive optical network, in fact an end-to-end -end network. On the right-hand side you have homes that are being connected via the PON network. So a PON network is a point-to-point, multi-point network. 
So I have one connection coming out of my, my OLT, my optical line terminal, and I can split that many times. Typically, the standard allows an XGS pawn up to 256 splits. Predominantly, we see 128 splits. What we actually see going on in real networks is 1 to 32 or 1 to 64, because there's a bit of a trade-off, and I'll come to that in a second. So the high level, the blue here is the fibre <coughs> from my optical line terminal. This is the PON platform at the head end that does the magic. This is the, the smarts that allows many customers to be connected to one fibre and that supports the various PON protocols that allows that to happen. The OLT in turn is connected towards the core, typically by a what's called a BNG, a broadband network gateway. This is a service router. This service router understands the customer services that you're delivering. So it's a profile of the services and it manages a whole range of, of aspects in terms of delivering the service to the end customer. So in a very simplified model, in the home there's a piece of electronics that terminates that fibre that takes it from the pond world into a world that we as individuals can, can consume. So that would be Ethernet in the majority of cases. So now I've got an Ethernet connection coming out of that device and I can plug that into perhaps it's a Wi-Fi router gateway, maybe it's a set-top box, or any other device I happen to have in the home. So really there's three core components from a PON network. There's the optical line terminal sitting in the central office, a street cabinet, the head end. There's the fiber that connects that towards the customers, and there's a device in the customer prem that allows the end-to-end -end communication In terms of those OLTs, and this is very much focused on that, this, this discussion today, there's a whole gambit of, of sizes and shapes and configurations that are available on the market. And on the left-hand side of the picture, we're showing a chassis-based OLT. I've tried to be fair to all of the vendors here, so I'm not selecting any specific vendor. Many vendors have similar configurations, but on the very left-hand side, this is a, a Nokia FX model of OLT. It supports up to 256. PON ports, so it's a highly dense chassis based system that you can deploy typically in the central office but they're also able to be deployed in street cabinets. To the right of that is just a smaller version, in this case this is from a company called Dasanzo. There are again many other vendors that have similar size models. To the right of that is a, a one rack unit shelf based OLT, industry parlance are typically calling it a pizza box. So it's just a small box um, these can be environmentally hardened with a smaller number of ports, typically 16, we see them in 12, sometimes 8, sometimes 32. And then to the right of that is actually, that's a technetics box, a little bit of promotion for us, which is our remote OLT. So this, if you like, is a self-contained OLT in, 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 its own, in its own cabinet, if you like. So it's completely hardened and ready to deploy as a complete unit. And then to the right of that, and this may be new to some of you, I think many of you probably are aware of it, there's actually a single port OLT. So there's a very smart company in North America that collapsed the silicon to a point where we have an OLT that's a single port. And that's that right-hand device. And they've packaged it as an SFP, and that SFP can be installed into a variety of hosts, typically an Ethernet switch. And you can transform that Ethernet switch port to become a PON port. So you can see there's a huge raft of options here for building the networks and this opens up opportunities. So just to sort of contrast that, so a street cabinet build or even a central office like hub, hub end build would probably be a chassis based system. It's probably servicing you know thousands of customers, uh, 2,000, 4,000, 8,000, 10,000. We, we, we see that already. We see that in the UK where these cabinets are being built big chassis systems. There's a lot of surround support there. If you can imagine, a big chassis system is quite power hungry. So there's a lot of thermal management required, which in turn means uh, environmental conditioning, fans, cooling. Um, these big systems, if they fail, obviously have a massive blast radius. So you need power resilience. The, uh, the chassis themselves have resilience. They've got dual fabric switching components, power supplies. So these become big systems, they serve lots and lots of customers. Smaller systems, less parts to them, um, servicing smaller, smaller group of customers. Uh, and they're just overall physically smaller as well. 
and typical numbers there on the small side is hundreds of, of connected customers or hundreds of homes parts. So we just look at what actually is going on. So again, the pictures on the left here are just of some of the UK service providers and some of their build. Um, the very top there is City Fibre. So their, their approach is basically to build a central office. That's a huge cabin that they deploy with you know, highly redundant power sources, generators and so on, because they've got a lot of technology sitting in that box. So they've got a, uh, less of these, but they put a lot of stuff inside there and service you know, large city areas. Then you've got the more street cabinet approach, and again, we're all familiar with this, open reach street cabinets, hyper optic street cabinets, um, giga clear, the, all of the alt nets are, or majority of the alt nets are, are deploying in that way. But a lot of them are also reusing existing assets that they can purchase or rent from open reach, so they can deploy into existing infrastructure today, into the Yard Exchange buildings or central offices, and put technology in those as well. So we're seeing all those ranges of old tubes being deployed, some about 16 ports, 32 ports, 64 ports, up to 256 ports, and in fact, multiple old tubes in some of those really big exchange points. So lots of equipment going in. The point here is there's a lot of cost associated to that, lots of cost. A street cabinet with an old T battery, power backup, support systems around that, this is getting into hundreds of thousands of pounds, dollars, euros, depending on what currency you want to use. They take quite a lot of planning. Even if you've got a cookie cutter model, there's still planning around where am I physically going to deploy it? Have I got permission to deploy it? Way leaves, permits, putting a slab in, putting the ducting into it. There's a lot of cost and planning associated to that. It costs lots and lots of money and takes lots and lots of time. In fact, we're involved with a customer right now and it's actually a fairly simple project. But the duration of getting permissions it, it takes months. It can take years, in fact, in some locations. So lo lots and lots of money being spent on these big systems, which means it's, it takes a lot of time. It slows down that process of targeting specific customer groups and getting them connected. Oh, actually, one thing I want to emphasize here as well. When you build a network like this, you've got trade-offs to consider. So back to that pond network, that fiber network, um, I've got a laser that's firing light down my fibre and that light um, is, uh, is being distributed to customers and the trade-off here is distance versus number of splits. So as I split, I'm using some of that power and as I go over distance, I'm using some of that power. So I have to find the right trade-off between distance and split. So if I'm driving over a longer distance because I've got a big central office-based system servicing a larger community, I'm now trading distance over the my split ratio, so I might be at a lower split ratio, but if I'm really close to those customer groups, <coughs> I, I can use my optical budget for splits rather than distance, maybe I can get a better port utilisation and a better return on that port. This is just re-emphasising what I've just said. So we look at this again just to you know, give you some uh, view into some of these systems. This is not a UK system, this is a, another part of the world, but it's the same sort of style of build. So this is a two metre high cabinet, so it's not a wider cabinet, it's just a very tall cabinet where an old T is deployed in it. And you can see below that all of the fibre management that's going on. It's not the prettiest of deployments, I have to say. Um, on the right hand side though, there's a cabinet door there with a fan system, filters, it's, it's having to provide cooling environmental management to that system in there. These larger old tees can be hundreds of watts, in fact, getting close to a kilowatt of power consumption. So there's a lot of thermal management required to, to deal with that. And failure. There's pictures of it all. So uh, even when you spend all that money on a big chassis based system with all of the resilience built into it, I, I diversely root into that, put all that battery in there, I've got all of that power resilience, it can still get destroyed. It's still gone. These are rare occurrences, but they do happen. Uh, the, the, you'll like the cabinet there with the umbrella. In fact, I was just speaking to a customer just recently, um, and they're, they're still doing this. They're going to the cabinet, opening the door on a hot day because of the solar gain in the cabinet, it's overheating the equipment. 
So all these things are real, real challenges. And, we're, and uh, you know, in the UK, we're seeing massive changes in our, in our weather. Um, well, it's a wet day today, but we're also seeing extreme uh, heat as well. Um, and, and that's across the, across the globe we're seeing this. So all of those things have to be baked into the thought process about how we build these systems. And again, perhaps a smaller approach uh, can alleviate and mitigate some of these problems. So with a smaller system, you can be really targeted. So I can, rather than the sort of blanket approach, build and they will come, I'm just going to put a system into this city here um, and hope that everyone's going to connect to it. Now I'm going to get targeted. I'm going to put a, deploy a smaller system. I'm going to go after certain postcodes, certain demographics. It might be a campus network. It might be a business park. But I, what I'm looking for here is customers that are not just passing them, but I want them to connect. So with my smaller system, I can be very, very specific. Timing of build is much more controlled. With a smaller system, like I showed you, with the remote OLT itself contained, it's a much easier system to deploy. I can deploy that perhaps faster and connect those customers faster because I'm only interested in specific groups. I can blow that out, of course. I can keep adding those systems as I go. But the main element here is to get quick returns. So I'm targeting specific customer groups, be they business customers or residential customers, connecting them, getting a return, reusing that money for the next build, next build, next build, and so on. But I'm sure what I'm showing is I'm getting higher penetration, I'm getting higher return on my investment, and I'm getting to myself to a point where I've got cash to keep extending and building my network. So there's small remote OLTs, pretty much you can install anywhere. <coughs> In the case of the Technetics box, it's IP68. It's got an uh, upper temperature range of plus 65, minus 40 for the negative end <coughs> and the lower end. It, you can deploy pretty much anywhere and sort of on a pole side of a building. What we're seeing is small, again, all nets. Go to the local village, or uh, go to a village and talk with the community. There may be a shop, a church, um, other shared real estate that can be used for deploying the OLT. So they're working with the community, talking to them. They know they want connectivity. They find, in fact, I was speaking to someone earlier, William earlier. If you speak to your customers, they themselves become your mouthpiece to other customers. Um, everyone wants that faster connectivity. So again, it can help some of these service providers get very, very focused and very targeted. We're getting closer to the customers, so I can increase my spit ratio. So I put this in the village that's close to who I'm connecting to. I'm using my optical budget for connectivity rather than distance. Now I can increase my split ratio. Most customers today, and we're seeing this certainly across other markets in Europe, GPON actually is more than sufficient for most consumers, residential customers. If you're building a new network, it doesn't make sense to deploy GPON today. You may as well be deploying for the future. XG, the cost points of XGS bond are not that extreme over GPON. The CPE, of course, does cost more. That's coming down. But we're seeing that, that sort of change go on. Um, and then, um, so getting close to the customers means I can connect to them fast and get that return quickly on them. Um, and uh, uh, I'm losing my train of thought here. Oh, yeah, the, the other thing I want to mention here is the lower power consumption. So with a smaller unit, um, typically they're sort of sub 100 watts. Again, in the case of our unit, it's, it's 50 watts or below. So it's a much easier sort of unit to power, and you can consider other power options. Uh, one, one of them may even be augmenting that with some PV panels. Not that you're going to probably uh, service the power demand of that unit uh, over its lifetime, but it would certainly complement and certainly help with perhaps some green credentials that we all want to see and starting to you know, put power back into to the environment or consume less. Um, and I mentioned there is just a smaller blast radius. So again, with this smaller unit where I'm servicing you know, a few hundred customers, if it does fail, um, I, I'm dealing with a few hundred customers rather than thousands of customers, uh, which could be quite problematic. So that's, again, just this small remote OLT. We're not the only ones that make OLTs like that. There are several vendors, and it's becoming more interested in this particular part of the environment. But you can... Just see here's one of our, uh, our sales guys with his hand by just contrast, you can see the size of it. It is small. And that's not just the old team, that in effect is the street cabinet. That 
is the housing. It has fibre management in it. It has the power supply. It even has first stage of split in there. So absolutely collapsed, small, deploy these sorts of things anywhere. We think these are great tools for, for network operators to start to target uh, specific customer groups. Typically, they're around four ports. There are some six port versions out there, going all the way to sort of two port versions. In this case, this is a four port, low power consumption, which is the earlier. You're connecting hundreds of customers rather than thousands of customers. Be very targeted, I keep mentioning that. Um, so great for holiday parks, we're seeing a lot of interest in. Um, business parks, science parks, academic parks, um, and, and then specific customer groups that you want to target. Uh, actually, last point here, I should mention this. Some of you may or may not be aware, but if you're using OpenReach assets, OpenReach have made a, uh, a plan, um, it's called their Exchange Exit Program. They're going to close their exchanges, so they plan to, to, uh, to close those over the over the 2030 period basically, so by 2030 there's a small number that will be closed but into the 2030s and beyond they, they expect to close up to 4,500 of those. So if they're currently being used, those all nets are going to need to consider perhaps an alternative location for the housing of their network equipment. So renewable energy, again, all nets need to look at, in fact, all network operators need to look at how they reduce their power consumption. And perhaps with smaller systems, there's a way of doing that using PV panels where I've got, again, a very distributed environment. I can use a PV panel to augment the power demand locally. Probably going off grid is a bit too much to ask, particularly in the UK. Maybe that'll work in, in, uh, in other regions. Um, you can put battery in there, of course, but now I'm I've collapsed my network into a, a, a lot of, or uh, expanded my network into a lot of smaller parts. I've got the issue about, I've got lots of places to power, but it also opens up the opportunity to look at alternative ways of powering it. And of course that then means, um, what else could I use that asset for? So uh, we've got a partner in Australia that's using that asset for security aspects. You could also use that asset for perhaps um, town type Wi-Fi distribution. Um, there's lots of other things that could come from having an asset like that where the OLT is providing the fiber connectivity. I'm using my solar array to uh, gather some power and push that back into that unit, some battery backup locally, but I could attach and utilize it in other ways. It doesn't have to be quite as industrial as that. That could be on a pole, that could be on the side of a building. Uh, there's a number of configurations that you could consider. So remote powering, I need a local power feed, I could do that by a PV panel, I could do that through the friendly customers, I could do that through the village hall, the primary school, the church, there's a whole range of ways of getting access to power as well as obviously buying it from the utility. Because they're low power consumption, you can look at unmetered power or the, 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 the uh, variation of power demand is pretty flat, so you can talk to the utility company and purchase an unmetered power source which then sort of controls the spend, it flattens that out. You've got complete control over that. You can also reuse the copper infrastructure. In a recent discussion with OpenRidge, which was very interesting, you know, they still got a lot of copper plant. And obviously the uh, telephone exchanges, as they were, to make a telephone work, you had basically a neg 48 volt battery source applied to the telephone line. That copper plant still exists. It could be a power distribution network, so we're engaging now in some discussion there. And of course the coax network, it's copper, it's a power distribution network. So some of those assets could be reused, not as a communication link, but now as a power distribution link for these remote units. So can I reduce OPEX, or can I reduce my power consumption? get good tick on the green credentials, actually show, be quite demonstrable in the fact that I am uh, looking at alternative ways to, <coughs> to power my systems, but also lower my power bill. And, you know, the power bill is becoming larger and larger and larger, becoming quite material in the overall cost. So can I reduce that, improve my green credentials, and also is there other values that I can get out of an asset like that? 
So in terms of looking at the different models here, and we mentioned again the larger Big Bang approach, putting big chassis systems in and going after the, the big urban areas, actually there's a lot of customers that live in, not just in rural areas, but in highly distributed locations and highly distributed geographies. So clearly cities like London, Manchester, Birmingham and so on, huge amount of density, you're going to get a lot of customer connectivity, but there are a lot of customers that are sitting in uh, outside those large city areas. And so this is uh, some information from, um, from OECD, um, and, it look, and they did this uh, across Europe, uh, and, and it's, it's, it's really high, it's quite startling actually, that um, in many countries, just look at France, where there's a high population distribution, and lots of folks that are living in areas that are less than, or in the region of 150 to 800,000. Now that's a big number, but the next part of that is they're subdivided into villages and towns. So now is that a much better approach is to actually target those villages and towns in, in that sort of way rather than that, or, or augment and add to what you already have in that way. So this actually really does, uh, I think, provide a nice visualization of the fact that you know, lots and lots of customers, there's a big available market, for those rural, fringe, suburban type locations. In fact, another customer we're talking to has taken the chassis approach. They've done about, I think, 300, 400,000 homes passed. But in their particular territory, they've identified another 1.2 million homes they want to pass where they don't want to use a big system. They're looking for smaller systems, more agile, more nimble systems. We call this a fine grain approach over a coarse grain approach. So rather than a big system, try to attract as many customers as you can for that particular area of servicing. It to be a, a lot finer grain, be very targeted again, get a quick return on that investment. So again, just to try and visualize this. <coughs> so what we see is we build a system in an area. It might be a, a, a get a street based cabinet for a particular part of a city or a, a large town that's going to service maybe 8,000 8, homes passed. I might be into another area with say 15, 10,000, 12,000. So these, these big old T's I can populate in a way to service those different customer and community sizes. But can I fill that in, those gaps, with smaller systems? And that's clearly what we're starting to see customers or the uh, uh, fiber network operators become interested in because their current system build, it's that trade-off I mentioned earlier, I put my big system in, I've got a compromise between split ratio and distance, there'll be areas that I just can't reach from that existing build. Do I put another chassis system in? Probably not, because I'm not going to get enough customers to warrant or make that a viable uh, investment. So how do I fill those gaps? Put smaller systems in. And could you consider actually forgetting about the big systems altogether and just using a fine growing approach in its entirety? And the big benefit here now is that, again, I'm going after specific customer groups to start with. I'm getting a quick return on that uh, money that I spend to then fund the next level of investment, the next build program. So I'm starting to probably build a different economic model and build a greater stability in terms of the success of, uh, of my company. So a single build model, you're going to have lots more nodes, of course. Operationally, that might be more complex. Probably not. We have most, uh, most of these systems are remotely managed, of course. Um, there's a, a lot of great tools that allow that to happen. You've got to deploy it. You're probably going to do some truck runs anyway when you pull the fiber to the end customer. So you're going to be passing some of these locations. So in the grand scheme of things, it probably doesn't actually result in any uh, additional real cost. Um, I've got less ports, but I've got a higher split ratio on those ports, so I'm getting a benefit there because I'm getting on closer to those communities, higher split ratio, less ports, less overall cost. The industry tends to talk about the cost per port of these devices, so now I'm getting more customers attached to each of those ports. These smaller systems, lower power consumption means typically they don't need cooling. They don't need forced air cooling anyway. They can be just conductive or passive cooled. 
no fans. Lots of service providers talk about if I put a street cap in, it's going to be quiet because I've got all those fans in there. And, you know, the, 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 the folks that are housing, housed near it, they can hear that stuff. It, it becomes a nuisance, uh, certainly in the quiet periods in the evenings. So again, we hear that all the time. It's a, a lot of a, a consideration into the architecture of street cabinet, the systems that are in there, um, optimizing it in terms of power consumption, keeping them quiet and so on. And then how we move to higher speed, how we go uh, beyond g bond and XGS bond. Again, just another vendor, I'm trying to be fair in terms of, of uh, you know, representation here. So this is a chassis-based system again, uh, 256 ports, so these are uh, uh, each of these line cards here that you can see to the left and right of the center. They have 16 ports, some of them are 8 ports, and you populate that chassis as you build. But if I want to change that out now from being a 10 gig system or a GPON system and go to 25 gig, how do I do that? Because this chassis also has what's called a fabric or a switching component to it that was sized around the original GPON or XGS PON capacity. If I'm going to go to 25 or 50 gig PON here, something has to change. So either I'm going to rip and replace this because I'm going to change the fabric cards out, or I'm going to have less ports on my car, so my density is going to go down. And if I do that, now I'm back into maybe I should be considering smaller OLTs and being a lot more agile in how I build my network. So a lot of consideration here has to go into that migration path and what I invest in today, what does that do for me in the future, and what sort of uh, issues and bottlenecks does that create. We know some vendors right now, I think, are demonstrating a line card that is 2 by 25 gig. So I've gone from 16 ports on my card to 2 ports on that card. Now that card was servicing probably 64 customers per port. I've got 16, 16 ports on there. Now I'm doing 2 ports. So that, that's a radical change to the architecture and a lot of consideration. Can I, if I've got a street cabinet with one of these in there, how do I, how do I change that? I'm probably going to have to build another street cabinet next to it to make that change. Again, smaller systems perhaps make that a lot easier to start to add these new throughput. So if I move to 25 gig pond, perhaps I look at a smaller box and augment that alongside that. Now 25 gig and 50 gig pond realistically is, is many years away in terms of uh, large scale deployment. And it will be very targeted at specific applications, probably more network service oriented, um, less about residential customers, and perhaps business parks and some other applications, mobile back call and so on. But it's certainly coming and there's a lot of excitement about that. So in terms of how you combine those things, then you perhaps start to look at, again this is, uh, maybe some of you are aware of this, but you can buy systems today that will support what's called coexistence. So each of these individual ports actually will support GPON and DXGS PON concurrently. You have to plug in a special transceiver. That special transceiver has two sets of lasers and receivers on it, so it's able to do GPON and XGS PON simultaneously. So on my same fiber network, I could run 50 gig PON. It operates at a different wavelength. How do I combine those? So I just use a, an external component, WDM component, to combine, in effect, these different wavelengths into the same fiber plant that's servicing that, that, uh, that customer community. So we need to consider here how do we do targeted but also graceful introduction of some of these higher speed PON services which will have a massive impact on these existing deployments. It's not going to be easy. Mustn't forget HFC of course, so there's a lot of cable networks already in today. Some of the cable networks are considering upgrades ultimately to DOCSIS 4.0 and 1.8 gigs the opportunity to deliver high-speed internet that um, certainly competes with XGS POM and, and, and in fact in some cases will outperform it. But in terms of some of those existing HSC networks, that also is not easy. It requires quite a bit of investment in the upgrade of the, the physical plant. And I still will have power user customers attached to my, my cable plant. Those that are perhaps working from home, running a business from home, and they have attached some small companies to it that are basically hogging the available bandwidth on the HFC network. So can I take them off the HFC network, 
build in parallel or fibre network and take the power users away, free up the capacity on the HFC network for the, the normal behaviour and use from your typical residential customer. So we see that as also a great interest and we see that the smaller LTEs fit nicely into that model as well because in the cable TV network they have smaller street cabinets, they have hardened devices that sit inside those cabinets. This device would also uh, sit as a companion solution and allow POM to be run in parallel with the cable TV network and that POM could be in parallel with the cable TV network or the greenfield opportunities in the new build. How are you for time? <clears throat> so just to wrap up on this particular slide, um, so we see a, a great opportunity for service providers to start to look at a different model using smaller units. And those smaller units are not just about how I architect my network and looking at power, but also that changing perhaps the the economic model is not really going to change the total cost, but it will change the spend profile. So that idea of spend today, get a customer connected or customers connected to it quickly, that gives me that rapid return, starts to pay for that, that then funds my next bill and so on. We think that should be of great interest and of great value to, to the audience. Smaller systems may not need the level of resilience in them that a bigger system requires. Because when you put resilience into those bigger systems, they don't come free of charge. Those additional fabric cards, those additional power cards, those additional CPU cards, that additional battery capacity, dual power, that will cost money, lots of money. So maybe there's a model here that allows me to tolerate perhaps some failure because the impact of that failure is not as extreme as a large system failure. So again, it's just opening the mind to are there other ways for me to architect my network and look at slightly different cost models? Can I move faster as well? As we mentioned earlier, you can't get away from the fact that digging holes and putting fibre takes time and it's the biggest part of the cost. But as I start to break down all of those parts, are there other areas that I can be nimble around? Even putting a street cabinet requires a, a lot of time for planning, a lot of expense in terms of putting a slab in, all of the civils workers, etc. Smaller unit, if I found a friendly village where they've got the local store, as I mentioned, the church, the, uh, the primary school, the, uh, the friendly customer that wants to help the community, you can move a lot faster. The, the way the situation may be slightly less, the permits may not be quite as onerous in, in, uh, in getting them. And can I again target those customers? I think this is something that the Altnets need to start to really focus on is is getting that rapid return, connecting customers that want the service, prepared to pay for that service, and getting a quick fill on that on that port, so I'm getting a quick return. I, I want high penetration. I don't want to put my network to places where customers don't want it. What's the point in doing that? I'm just spending the money poorly, and my investors won't be happy with me, and I'm probably not going to be in business in the future. Can I combine that, as I mentioned, just in that previous slide, the HFC networks? So I think some cable operators are looking at <clears throat> you know, big bang approach, I'm just going to rip and replace. Others are looking at forget fiber, I'm just going to go high speed doxis. And others are looking at how can I augment and start to do both those worlds. And how does that grace me, gracefully allow me to move into the, the more pure fiber domain? Reducing that, again, I'm sort of keep mentioning the same thing, but that sort of market to build to build. So reducing that cycle there, so I've gone to that particular area, are you interested? Yes, I am. Great, I can build fast, I can connect you fast, I'm getting a return fast, so I'm reducing that time to getting my money back. So success-based investment. And then that alternative pairing, that there potentially are options there that could be considered as to how I reduce my bill, just look at other ways, improve my green credential, show that I, you know, demonstrably doing something here to, to reduce my power consumption, reduce my carbon footprint. <coughs> Any questions, I guess? There are. So this is going to be interesting. Could you please say your name and where you're from? And no. ask your question. Yeah. Hi, uh, this is Rashid from Corning. On the 
line side of the remote OLT, so the import from what would traditionally be a central office or a head end, what is the what is usually the speed and format of that import? Is it Ethernet into a switch back at the head end? Yeah, typically it will be Ethernet. So you'll see, I mean, most OLTs today will have. Um, uh, uplink cards that will be 10 gigabit, 25 gigabit, 100 gigabit, and they give you those options, all Ethernet. And you can put different transceiver types in there depending on the distance, so you can use short range if you're in a central office, but if you're at a distance, you could use a, a, an ER or long range type, type or even a, a, a coherent transceiver if that's required. So, the, uh, in essence, the architecture is point to point Ethernet to the remote OLT and then PON beyond that. Yeah, the, yeah, to the old is a uh, sort of classic point to point network. Um, you could diversely route some of those connections as well. Most of those old T's come with multiple uplinks, so you can build some resilience. That's important probably to do that. You can go east west on that. And you can mix those as well because they're an Ethernet switch. It, it, you know, it's anything to anything inside the Ethernet switch. So you can come at one side of 10 gig, the other side of 25 gig or 100 gig. And most of them have a the number of ports, so you could start with 10 gig day one move to 100 gig in the future as demand starts to increase on the on the custom side. So you've got that, that's the beauty of an Ethernet fabric or a switch, you've got that flexibility. You're making me walk around there. <laughs> <laughs> this wasn't part of my plan today, thanks. Sorry about that. It's uh, Mark Burns from Liberty Global. A um, couple of questions. Um, what's the power premium going from, say, uh, XGS POM to 25 gig and 100 gig, how much extra power? That's a good question. I'm not, I've not seen, so, um, I've not yet seen what the 25 gig and 50 gig transceiver consumption will be. I know from the, so from the micro OLT perspective, it's not actually a big step up, uh, but that's just 25 gig versus 10 gig. Uh, so currently with the, the self-contained transceiver which is a little bit onerous because it's got the old T device in there as well as the optical transceiver component they run max at about 3.3 watts typical is lower than that and the 25 gig doesn't look like it's going to be much above that typical um, XGS POM standard optical transceivers their upper uh, limit of those is sort of two to two and a half watts and again, the 25 gig ones that I've seen so far are in the same ballpark. Um, I think it gets interesting when you get to 50 gig and 100 gig because they're talking about coherent technology. Mm -hmm. When you talk about coherent technology, you're then adding DSP into that, uh, digital signal processing, if that means anything to everyone. So you've got a lot of manipulation to do about how you extract the, the, the data out of that, that link. And that's, that's a piece of silicon, so it's going to consume power. <coughs> the other thing, of course, as you go to 25 gig, 50 gig, You've got a bigger switching fabric, so you've got a bigger hunk of silicon in there that's just moving more bits. So that also will. So I, I don't know. I've not done that study. I, I, it's probably in the order of I don't know, ten to twenty percent. Of course, you're also riding the evolution of silicon, as, you, as you're all probably aware. You know, we've we, you know, in, in the last what, ten years we've gone from thinking ten gig was high speed to a hundred gig, four hundred gig, eight hundred gig is already here in the white box space. 800 gig is, is available, and there's also, you know, they're even looking at 1.6 terabit in terms of the, just the, the, uh, the throughput, or the port throughput, um, and there's 52 gigabit throughput silicon that's already, or terabit, sorry, not gigabit, terabit silicon that's already available. So I think uh, there will be a power consumption increase, but I don't think it's going to be radical. It's probably yeah, I think it will change the uh, required power infrastructure? I, th I don't think so. It obviously, it depends on how, um, what margin was already built into the existing Absolutely. system. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't think, as I showed on that, old, that big old T, if you go to 20, there's some trade-offs, isn't there? So if you go, if you go to um, 25 gig as an example, you're actually, in the current architectures, you're gonna have less ports anyway. Um, so you probably end up, if you do that, probably consuming less power in that system. Of course, you won't be connecting the same number of customers. Second. Question. What about the um, optical receive powers required? I shouldn't have this answer, but anyway. Um, <laughs> you know, if you design the system for 10 gig, then you go, okay, 
actually you know, get in a decade or whatever, to 25, 50 gig, they don't have to redesign all the optics on it. Will, no, it, still, will it still work within the same uh, optical? Yeah, um, yeah, uh, yeah that's, that's the intention. Um, again, the um, so 25 gig for sure, um, although not everyone's possibly going to move to 25 gig, they may leap from that. 50 gig, I think, is fine. Um, so I think that yeah, that's built in, that's baked into the models. It's the same split ratio, the same optical performance, um, but that may well have we, you, you, the first question as sort of net impact on, on power consumption. And I say particularly when you go to 50 and 100 gig because you're running coherent type technology, so that will have. Good questions. Um, Paul Smith retired um, Virgin Media, or whatever it is now. <laughs> Talking about HFC, in my experience with HFC, the cabinet is absolutely grand. In some cases, you couldn't get the doors closed. Right. <laughs> What's the possibility of putting the ROLT in a chamber? And you're talking about IP68 for waterproofing, which I had a big read a second ago, and it's one meter for 30 minutes. Do you have any provisions or any thoughts for waterproofing that? And again, in my experience, um, the, the chambers are full of water in some cases. So, but ideally, the ROLT could go in a chamber in a ducted network. Um, my mind would make uh, a nice, easy solution. Yeah, a absolutely. Um, so, what you, uh, the point you make, are absolutely the practical elements of doing that. Um, the big game in doing it in, into a chamber is, of course, the cooling aspect. I mean, I'm now away from uh, no solar gain really. I mean, there is a bit of solar gain, but I'm, I'm below the, the pavement level. Um, so there's some big benefits in doing that. We think that would be great. Um, you can use, I forgot the name, but there's an arm, isn't there? You can put it inside the chamber and attach it to. So it's, I think it's physically viable to do that. Um, but to your point, flooding then becomes an issue. Yeah, long term uh, chamber full of water, we'd have to uh, improve the. The, uh, the waterproofness of the box, oh sorry, the waterproofness of the box beyond IP68, um, but, but definitely doable, absolutely. In, uh, in fact, we're looking at, currently looking at a, another generation of LT beyond what we have that potentially might even be solid state. And what I mean by that is, is rather than having electronics and a box, is that we totally encase, in effect, the electronics in the box as part of the heat sink, so it's completely self-contained and it would then inherently be waterproof. Of course, you'd still want to connect to it um, and would require uh, you know, the, the appropriate connectors that uh, could be submerged for long durations. But I think it would be a really great practical solution. It removes all that stuff at street level. really would be a, a great way of doing it. In fact, there's um, an interesting company that we're talking with that do a lot of roadside type cabinets. They do there's some of these speed limit signs and various other things. And they've got a cabinet actually just submerges into the ground. It's very neat. I don't know how, again, how reliable that sort of cabinet is, but there are some novel solutions out there. But I think that the idea of putting into a chamber is, we've got lots of them, haven't we? They're everywhere. <laughs> yes. Hello, Gillian um, Kendrick from Real World. My question is, um, I'm a much softer question. It's not a technology-based one. Oh, at the beginning of this, <laughs> no, but at the beginning of this, you talked about the fact that people are looking at return on investment. So it's not homes fast, it's homes connected yes. if they're interested in. And you also made a statement, everyone wants faster connectivity, but do you think that's true? I think an awful lot of people don't want to switch because of the problem that you switch to a bare piece of fast connectivity, but you don't have BT Sport, or you don't have... That's, that's a <laughs> that is a good soft question. <laughs> Um, anyone from BT in here? No, you're safe. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to say, BT support is not it's not great, is it? I mean, I, frankly, my experience of, of other operators has been better than BT. Um, what I think you find with smaller... No, no, I said sport, sports, not support. Just the... The service, you know, like buying, buying Netflix. Oh, so buying sorry, apologies. apologies. Right? apologies. So yeah. it's, it's the ability to provide service yeah, yeah. that bandwidth. Yes. Um, well, certainly the old T technology is capable of doing that. Um, it's, it's what's sitting behind that, of course, in terms of your uplink connectivity. Um, so that, that's really, again, down to spend, putting the appropriate interconnects in. Um, 
if you look at the, I mean, the way that a network is architected, yes, I build my network, I've got my own local connectivity, and now I want to connect to the wider world. How do I do that? Well, most companies will then connect into an IXP. That gets me into the outside world. Now, I buy a port, whether that's it. So in the UK, you'll become a member of the London Internet Exchange. And you buy a port into that, be that 25 gig, 100 gig, or whatever. And then you've got to size that correctly for the community that you're connecting. So I guess it's really down to the, the service provider putting the right infrastructure in behind it. The POM system itself is more than capable. Um, and certainly with XGS POM, which is the predominant build, the new build, it's a huge amount of capacity there. I've got one last question. You spoke about interconnect. Mm -hmm. OSS BSS. Yes. How does this connect backwards? You mentioned a load of names. How are these going to all connect to each other? Well, most network providers, you know, they very few, in fact, the Altnets are doing this, but most service providers that have been around for 10 or more years, they've got a collection of OSSs anyway. They've had this problem since, you know, since time began. So they're, they're, they've basically uh, inherited a number of systems over time. So from this perspective, there's a lot of work being going in around open standards, creating um, published interfaces, that, and, and a whole uh, industry of parts that allow you to connect things together. So there's a lot of standardization here. And you just take the interface and you plug that into the a system you want to plug it into. That sounds really simple. Um, it never is, of course. That was, that was the easy way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but they exist. We've it's, got one last question. Um, aggregation. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, Owen Williams, uh, self employed consultant, former Virgin Media. Aggregation of these systems, so you've got multiple remote OLTs. Is that going to lead to an increase in the backhaul infrastructure, so SIM connectivity or whatever, which is where massive cost starts to grow in? So you save on the OLT side and you just increase your cost on aggregation? Yeah, you would certainly have more aggregation points, of course. You, can have, you, can, you would consume more ports. You're going you're gonna to pull the I mean, the biggest part of this, of course, is pulling the fiber, which you were going to pull anyway. It's just now that I've got a piece of fibre, the uplink's just been moved deeper into the network, so I've still got fibre to that uplink. I am going to consume a port. I'm probably not going to consume a 100 gig port though. Maybe it's a 25 gig or a 10 gig port rather than a 100 gig port or a 400 gig port. So my port costs are number of ports I've got, but it's also the transceiver cost. A 10 gig transceiver is $25. A 100 gig transceiver is depending on distance, you know, that can be a couple of hundred dollars or even a couple of thousand dollars. So they're, they're, again, it's, it's not quite, a, it's, it's not easy to give you a simple answer because there's a lot of range here, but I think just a high level, yes, you have more points of connection, uh, which will naturally probably to a, a slightly increase in cost. What we're also seeing though, is it allows for alternative backhaul to be considered. You could use a wireless, connection for your backhaul to get that fiber connection in place quickly. Now that doesn't sound correct. I'm giving the customer fiber, but you're using radio. But if it's correctly engineered and it's only the backhaul, and I can run those backhaul uh, with microwave links, I can run at significant speeds, but I can certainly offer a 10 gig and above backhaul connectivity. That's more than sufficient capacity for a small remote or two sitting deep in the network. So it opens up those opportunities as well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks, Prof. Um, My pleasure. Look forward to next time. <laughs> now, we'd love you to have uh, Michael Lee, Tom Rick.